diagnosing autism. Are we getting it right? What was the most difficult part about growing up? I had no friends. No. Absolutely not. When my son was diagnosed, our response is, well, what does it mean? Mm. Were you actively seeking an autism diagnosis? Yes, I felt that I was a professional at it. <laughs> Why was it so important to you? Totally funding related. Have you ever been tempted to diagnose a child with autism when that's not necessarily the case? I think clinicians that uh, say otherwise are probably uh, not being too straight with you. So were you encouraged to seek that diagnosis even though yes. you knew it was something else? Yes. Welcome everyone, thank you all for being here. Kane, I'm going to start with you. You were diagnosed with autism when you were seven years old. What was that like? What's wrong with me? Because just being told at you know, an age when you're still trying to figure out what identity even means, let alone what your own is, being told right there that there is something that objectively makes you different from most other people is it's pretty hard for a kid. What was the most difficult part about growing up? Was it being in school? Yeah, it would have been um, what I like to call um, socialising at gunpoint, pretty much, because it, it is genuinely difficult for me to socialise, even at the best of times, because I am not that good when it comes to reading social cues, especially when it comes to reading emotions off of other people. Like, I often misinterpret things, um, assume that they're speaking in one tone when they're really speaking in another, and then just general awkwardness, not really knowing what's quote-unquote appropriate for certain situations. How are you feeling now? Um, right now, I'm, honestly, I'm perfectly comfortable with the fact that I have autism, because I have, you know, gotten past the point where it's, you know, it's something different or even something wrong. It's just, I just see it as a different way of looking at the world. So actually having that information, like, yes, this is what you have, this is how you might act, you might not act, actually having an idea of, you know, why I am the way I am definitely made things a lot, well, not a lot easier, but a bit easier. And what about friendships or relationships? Part of the misreading social cues thing mm. is more times than not I've often made more out of certain relationships than actually happened when I was um, um, well, supposedly seeing this girl and I made the relationship out to be a lot more than it actually was and I was actually creeping her out quite a bit mm -hmm. and it got to a point where she officially just said, okay, back off. And that did traumatise me quite a bit. Gretchen, you were 16 when you had Kane. When was it for you that you noticed something might not have been quite right? I s suspected there was... Um something amiss, probably around the age of three. Mm -hmm. He had a, a significant speech delay. Um, he was also very um, not aware of danger or risk. He was uh, not able to toilet train. Mm -hmm. And I took him to a paediatrician at the age of four um, he was diagnosed with semantic pragmatic disorder, okay. which at the time, the word autism never came up. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I didn't know what that even meant. So when he started school in kindergarten, he had a lot of trouble um, communicating, verbally communicating. Mm -hmm. He was quite aggressive in his early years. Parents would confront him as a small child, reprimanding him. I had a woman dive in front of, front of my car when I was pulling out of the school car park to uh, abuse me that Cain had um, ripped his, uh, one of her ch children's hats. Um, it just, it was a nightmare. Mm. It sounds like I it felt was. totally isolated, and Kane was totally isolated at school in the early years. 
And Kane was eventually diagnosed with Asperger's, which is, of course, now recognised as autism spectrum disorder. How did that diagnosis come about? Um, Kane was seven years old, and I got a call from the school saying that I had to go up there very quickly, that there was an emergency. And, of course, I quickly got up there, and to find out that Kane, at seven, <laughs> had written a suicide note and jumped off the second story building at school. And um, a few days later, when the things had settled, I went into the school on my own and met with the principal. He said, um, I think Kane might have Asperger's. And I had never heard of Asperger's before. Made an appointment with a paediatrician, took him in, and it was a very short process of diagnosis. And that was, that was how we got our diagnosis mm -hmm. at the age of seven. Josephine, your five-year-old son was recently diagnosed with autism. What made you go to the doctor initially? Well, at about three and a half, we decided to go see a speech therapist um, because he just didn't seem to be where I thought he should be. Um, and after about four or five months, she said, you should go see a paediatrician. Um, so he went and he said, he shows mild signs of autism and probably developmental delay. And yeah, it just it went from there. What was it about his behaviour that worried you most? his speech and probably his ability to control his emotions. Mm -hmm. And what was the reaction when you found out? I was very emotional. I did feel, I guess, guilt in a way that I had done something. Mm -hmm. And how did your family react as well? My mother said, um, oh, those doctors don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> He's fine. And it's pretty much the reaction from both outsides of parents. Uh, they're both immigrants from different countries, so older generation, you know. Amy, I'll come to you now. Um, you're 25 now. You were 19 when you were diagnosed with Asperger's yeah. syndrome. Um, how, how did that come, come about for you? Um, years of a absolute stress and being in and out of doctor's offices pretty much growing up and yeah. being told, you know, anything and everything under the sun that wasn't Asperger's syndrome. Um, but um, eventually we were able to sort of come to terms with it before I was diagnosed, um, just through interactions we had with friends and their families mm -hmm. and some of the things they were saying about either themselves or their kids. Um, it was just really clicking for my parents. Um, and so when uh, one night they came to me, I think I was about 17, and um, we were like, okay, it looks like this is what's going on with you. Um, and when I read up on the symptoms, it, it was a bit of a light bulb moment of, oh my gosh, this makes sense. Mm. So going through high school and not quite knowing um, if something was up, how did you feel through that period? Well, it, 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 went, it traces back to when I was even a little kid. I knew from a very young age that I was different and I hated it because I was excluded mm. almost entirely. Primary school is where it got really bad. Teachers, they just didn't know what to do with me, so they just put me on detention all the time. And, um, <laughs> which, uh, I actually made almost all my friends there. But I was the number one target mm. in my year when it came to the bullies. And I'm not talking just name calling in that. Mm. Um, I was beaten up. Um, I even had furniture thrown at me in the classroom and I didn't understand all the unwritten social rules that somehow I was bringing it on myself. Um, and um, it was a similar situation to Kane actually um, because um, I remember one time I was at a road uh, near my school. Um, there were a set of traffic lights, they were red, they were about to go green and there was a truck and I just remember thinking to myself, if I just step in front of that truck, it will be over. I was nine years old. No kid should want to be dead when they're nine, 10, 11, 12 years old, none. Um, so I was very depressed. I had no friends, none.
Absolutely not. So did you actively seek out Asperger's? Was that sort of something that you were looking for? No, we were just looking for answers. Mm. We were just looking for answers. And I think, I think at one point, you know, um, in the late 90s or early noughties, mum had suspected uh, Asperger's when she first heard about it. But very quickly that was shut down because, oh, girls don't get that. That was the attitude of, um, that was the attitude at the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, Asperger's syndrome had only entered the DSM when, um, after, I, after I was born. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it took a few years for the medical world to catch up. And even then, they were still in that, that mindset of autism is a boy thing. And Marcel and Stephen, what was that like for you, that diagnosis? <clears throat> it was a relief, which sounds strange, but... Um, it just confirmed what we've been suspecting all along. Mm -hmm. And when you're constantly told by doctors, the, you know, ones who are much smarter than you, uh, no, she's just clumsy. She's just a bit socially awkward, mm -hmm. um, bit of a chatterbox. That's it. Yeah. So you go away for a six months a year and then the things at home happen. Like it's, it's very stressful. Families that have autism in the home, it's really, really stressful mm -hmm. if they don't have the strategies yep. to deal day to day. But that's just the beginning. Mm -hmm. The diagnosis is, is just the beginning. But at least you know what you're working with, you know there's a path ahead. And yeah. When we got um, the diagnosis of Asperger's, we had tools in the toolbox that actually worked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing. Suddenly there was this de-stressor yeah. um, where you would do things and they'd respond. It, simple things like pragmatic language mm -hmm. had to be removed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you couldn't say, would you like to clear the dishes? Because they'd just sit there and go, no, nope, keep talking around the table. <laughs> <laughs> and all your guests would look at you and then you'd go, Amy, clear the table. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a huge relief when you get the right diagnosis. And Amy had a, a hearing impairment as well, is that yes. right? Yeah. Did that impact the situation at all? Yeah. Threw it off because they would uh, put a lot of the difficulties in social situations down to, well, you know, you just get, make sure people repeat themselves and then she'll understand because she'll hear. And it's like, yeah, but they did and she still didn't get it. She heard us, but she didn't get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's take a look now at how autism is diagnosed because it is complex. In 2013, the diagnostic criteria for autism changed. Four different diagnoses, including Asperger disorder, were grouped together and now fall under the broad collective term Autism Spectrum Disorder, or ASD. During a diagnostic assessment, experts look at the way children play, the way they respond and how they interact with others. They also take a family history and check the child's speech and development. But there's no consistent diagnosis process across Australia. Different states have different requirements. A recent survey showed that not all paediatricians follow current recommendations for diagnosing ASD. Michael, you're a paediatrician. Is diagnosing autism clear-cut? Um, obviously it's not. And I do feel a need to defend our profession. <laughs> <laughs> so if I can ask you to take the perspective of a medical specialist, mm -hmm. we go through specialist training Yep. And our orientation is around biological health. So we learn about asthma and epilepsy and the other diseases, I suppose, of childhood. And autism is, and other developmental disorders are a completely different type of phenomenon. Mm -hmm. The manifestation of them is in behaviour and developmental skills and you know, responses to situations. It's not rashes or lumps mm -hmm. or you know, difficulty breathing and things like that. So it's a very different toolkit. And so I think, to some extent, the profession's just playing catch-up. And, you know, mm. basically, we weren't prepared for this and we're learning on the fly. Mm. So having listed those other conditions, how do you then diagnose autism specifically? What are you looking for? Um, I think your summary gave a good explanation. There's a set of criteria out there and you need to gather sufficient evidence yep. to actually say, yes, those criteria fit. And in... Um, as they pointed out, there's a lot of diversity about how this happens, but again, the context, I think, creates a diversity. So if you're a single paediatrician in a country town, you don't have a multidisciplinary team available mm. to you, mm. so you do the best that you can, and you might get information from the school and family history and so forth, but yep. you have to deal with what you've got, whereas if you're in a big city hospital, you've got a much larger mm. opportunity to get information. So it happens in different ways in different places. So if we take Queensland as an example, what's needed there to make a diagnosis? 
Um, well, if I take it to its very essence, a signature on a piece of paper. Mm. So there is no... We have to sign off that the child meets the DSM-5 criteria. Nicole, you're a clinical psychologist. Mm -hmm. You've assessed hundreds of children for autism. Can you always be sure it's autism? By its very nature, clinical diagnosis isn't, um, isn't something you can be sure of because it, there's no blood test, um, there's no x-ray, there's no brain scan. Um, so it's a, it's a clinical decision-making process um, with DSM-5 as the criteria mm -hmm. um, and the gold standard being a multidisciplinary assessment, so involving speech pathologists, involving paediatricians, sometimes child psychiatrists. So it's a multidisciplinary team effort. And together um, with a group of expertise, mm -hmm. and I think that's the, the part that's come out of the family stories, is that there are so many people who don't have the expertise to be able to diagnose and therefore children get misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed or diagnosed with something else mm -hmm. and there's not enough um, research, there's certainly not enough research on girls. Andrew, you're a child and adolescent psychologist researching autism diagnosis in Australia. Is the diagnostic process consistent from state to state? Look, I think the best word to use is muddled between states. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, certain states, Western Australia is a good example, where there's very strict multidisciplinary diagnosis with a paediatrician, a psychologist and a speech pathologist have to come together and have a consensus yep. as to this child or this adult meets criteria for autism. And, sure. But as your graphic showed, there's also other states out mm -hmm. there that rely on a sole clinician. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a challenging situation for sure. It's not just differences between states, however, within states is also a challenge. Um, if we think about what, what, what uh, the government departments that deal with uh, autism, we've got three. Uh, and you might think that helps, but it doesn't. It means that autism slips between the cracks. We have disabilities, health and education. Now, if we have eight different states and territories, each with three uh, systems, plus the Commonwealth system, that's 25 different systems that often have different interpretations yeah. as to what autism means. And this is a, this is a massive problem because uh, we could all sit here and tell you stories of um, families who've moved between states and they've had to go on through another expensive, um, lengthy and emotionally draining diagnostic process. Yeah. Um, pe people who stay, stay within the same state and transition from health to education and have to go through another diagnostic process. It's just ridiculous. What about who can diagnose? I mean, that's another one. Is that consistent across the country? No, no, it's not consistent uh, uh, across the country. And um, this is just part of our beautiful federation of states. Um, where, and of course, where we have um, different systems uh, who are generating uh, different policies. Michael, after hearing all of this, are we getting it right? Um, I'm going to put a controversial point of view across. The emphasis is on whether we're diagnosing autism correctly or not. And I'd like to change the conversation a little bit. Are we understanding children correctly? Mm -hmm. yeah. So a child comes in and they have a, a situation, a plight, a set of concerns. My fear with all of this is if we focus on autism... I've seen situations where a child goes into an autism diagnostic service, they've waited a year to get into it, they've gone through probably $10,000 worth of assessment and they come out with no. <laughs> okay? The child still has a problem. We don't know what's going on. Mm. So if you have an assessment service that almost presupposes the outcome of the assessment service, I think we're making a big mistake. Mm. And my preference would be to go right back to core principles, kids struggle, we need to understand their struggle. We need to understand them if we're going to help them. Do you see parents who are actively seeking a diagnosis? Absolutely. So are we over-diagnosing? If a, uh, that child receives a diagnosis of autism, they will get the support. It's a Sophie's Choice that happens every day. I'm on a mission to find out how my generation defines what it is to be Indigenous. I stand on the outside and throw stones at it. We'll get inside and fix it. We're going to get to the heart of what it is to be young and black. Most horrible feeling ever. Your daughter's there, you can't find her, you don't know if she's dead or alive. And I don't know how people can do this to innocent children. SBS World News, nightly at 6.30. Once, we all thought flying was impossible. Then we realised there are no limits. Enjoy the freedom of limitless broadband data from just $69.99 a month on a no-locking contract from iinet, the number one in
customer service. With Ionet, the potential is limitless. We were all beautiful young Aboriginal women. To be harassed by the police because you didn't have a coin in your pocket, they could take you away. The Aboriginal cannot educate his child because of uh, lack of employment. My father was Charles Chicka Dixon. Dad said that the government counted everything. They counted the cattle, they counted the cars, they counted even the TVs, but they didn't count us. It's like we were invisible. The 1967 referendum was 50 years ago and Dad said people would spit on them, but in the end, we won. Because we got 90% of the vote. Australia said yes. Big celebrations, you know, woo woo. Maybe it, it, you know, touched their heart. That chest goes out and the head goes up because we're recognised. The result of the referendum on the Aboriginal question was a resounding triumph. Hyundai Tucson. See more amazing. I love the sound of rain on the roof, but I never thought they'd hear it like this. You can give hope where it's needed most. Please donate to the Red Shield Appeal at salvos.org.au. Woolies are now giving away fresh fruit to any kid shopping with an adult, which I think is pretty good. If just one kid gets an extra piece of fruit because it's free, you've got to be happy with that, right? It's a small gesture, but I think it shows real commitment to making Aussie kids fresh food kids. Brilliant. Free fruit for kids. Come on. That's why I pick Woolies. L is for the way you... Turn up the quiet. The new recording by Diana Krall. Featuring love, oh, night and day, blue skies, and more. I see night and day. You are the one. Diana Krall's Turn Up the Quiet, at now, at Demix, JB Hi-Fi, and, and on I iTunes. It just feels like I'll never get better. I'm scared I'm gonna die. Meet the Doctor, Changing Lives. That's me hope. That's why I love my job. The brand new series, Doctor Christian will see you now. Starts Monday, 7.35 on SBS and On Demand. Autism diagnosis in Australia has risen 25-fold in the past 50 years, with different rates in each state. In a 2012 survey, Victoria had the highest diagnosis rates in the country. Since 2012, national diagnosis rates have continued to rise over 42% to about one in every hundred children. Four out of five of those children are boys. Andrew, that 42% increase in autism diagnosis since 2012, it's a huge increase. What, what do you put that down to? Look, I think the scientific evidence is really shaping up pretty well on this one. We know that if you're born extremely preterm, you're at an increased risk for uh, being diagnosed with autism. And of course, fortunately, nowadays, kids who are born extremely preterm do survive. And so we're seeing an increased rate of kids with autism. But also, uh, there is a large sociological comp component to that increase in the prevalence. Um, so first and foremost, there is uh, an increase in the awareness of autism. And that's not just amongst um, families, it's also amongst clinicians uh, who realise that autism can manifest in different ways. And the other one, and I think it's beyond question now, is mm. that there are policies that have been created by governments that do contribute to the increasing prevalence, particularly mm. applying resources and funding to a diagnosis. Now I need to make clear here that I'm applying no value judgment on this whatsoever. What is, is, is all too common is uh, families who come in with a child who's developing super differently and we look at that child and we go, something's going on there. Um, we do an autism diagnosis uh, assessment, but the child doesn't quite meet diagnostic criteria. Mm. The family doesn't have means, but we know that if a, uh, that child receives a diagnosis of autism, they will get the support and that family's life will change forever. It's, it's, it's a Sophie's choice that happens every day. Mm. Mm. 
Michael, why do you think we're seeing this increase? I agree with Andrew that the, the energy from government and its government through early intervention and through educational systems basically says we will help this child if they have an autism diagnosis mm -hmm. when they're in that grey zone of complexity and uncertainty. To say that it's a yes or no diagnosis is incorrect and I think the systems are driving us into that. So the idea that you can nail it and get it right or wrong I think is completely incorrect. Is that um, parents feeling a desperation that doctors are sensing? Is that the reason there's been an increase and they're more willing to sort of give out that diagnosis? Uh, look, parents just love their kids and want to help their kids. Mm. And to some extent, the diagnosis gives them an explanation, as we've heard, but it's more than that. The, it's a pathway. If there is a system that says, I don't care what the label is, just understand my child, mm -hmm. care for my child, make sense of the weirdness of their behaviour and have a compassionate response rather than a judgmental response, they'll go for it. Is it doing more bad than good, though? No, I think it's doing good, but I think we're on a learning curve, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. and my only fear is that we prematurely jump into the bandwagon of autism rather than just go slowly and say, mm -hmm. let's just understand children. Mm -hmm. It's definitely true that children struggle. I think it's a mistake to just leap in and say everything's autism. Mm -hmm. We've done that before in medicine. Mm -hmm. We've had a history with ADHD where every bad kid had ADHD and mm. a large number of kids ended up on Ritalin that may or may not have needed it because mm. we just leapt into a diagnostic category too quickly. So are we over-diagnosing? Um, that's a hard question, but I think there are some kids where it might not be in their best interests. Lara, you have a 10-year-old son and a 7-year-old daughter who both have been diagnosed with autism. Your son's diagnosis was relatively straightforward. What happened with your daughter? Oh, a completely different story. And I knew this was going to happen, but that's okay. Um, when my son was diagnosed, we'd been smashed with that. And so we got through that diagnosis mm -hmm. and we needed to deal with him first. Mm -hmm. So it was about 12 months after his diagnosis that we started. That, to me, should have been long enough to get it sorted out, get things in place for her before she started school. She's in kinder with kinder teachers who I believe have absolutely no idea mm. about anything that wasn't classical autism. So we weren't getting any third party or independent um, observations of her. The speech pathologist um, conducted a couple of sessions with her and my daughter is a brilliant mimic. That's how she understands and processes her world. Mm -hmm. She'd been to assessments with her brother. She knew exactly what to do. So what did they say to you? What did they say the problem was? I've got a psychologist who's not available at the meeting and I've got a speech pathologist saying, everything you're telling me about my daughter, I'm not seeing. Mm. She came in and she said hello. She interacted with me. She answered my questions. Yes, she came into your office and she performed beautifully because that's what she does. Mm -hmm. So with a psychologist who's not there, a speech pathologist who says, look, this just doesn't measure up. The paediatrician just said, look, I can't do anything at the moment. Mm. And I have heard stories like those tonight of those young women who get to their teenage years and depression comes up and I did not want that. Mm -hmm. I could see it. I could see that path. And I did not want that for her. So I went to Melbourne. And a clinician sitting there saying, I have no idea why I have you sitting in my office because she is so clear cut. She is that girl that watches what everybody else is doing because she doesn't understand it. And then she mimics them. Mm. So she looks like she's fine. Do you think it was more about doctors getting the diagnosis right? Or was it just frustration because you could see it and they couldn't? There was a, I suppose there was a couple of parts to it. Frustration because there were those points where it really felt like oh, I was the only one seeing it. Mm -hmm. But I think because we're in a regional area, the providers that we're dealing with just don't have that expertise around those mm. differences between the boys and girls. And if you're trying to compare her against that model mm. of a boy, she doesn't fit the boy's model, mm. but she definitely fit the girl, fits that girl's model. Were you actively seeking a diagnosis and, and why? I think we were all being deprived of a really good relationship with her because she would come home, she'd lose it at me. At that point, I didn't have the full understanding 
that it was her exhaustion. And I'd walk out of the room. She's busy yelling at me. And I would, I would walk out of the room because I couldn't put up with it anymore. Mm. So I knew that if we didn't have some way of understanding her better, you know, she's six and seven, just wasn't going to have a good foundation. Mm -hmm. We know that for every four boys diagnosed with autism, one girl is diagnosed. Why do you think there is such a big difference? In general, because <laughs> boys are more annoying. And particularly when they're a little bit different from average, the level of annoyance is much larger. And I think temperamentally, and I'm, I'm generalising quite heavily, the girls are less annoying. And I suspect, just like ADHD, as time progresses, we will understand that the actual truth is more equal than one in four. Mm -hmm. Gretchen, I just want to come back to you. Um, Kane's the eldest of your four boys. They've all been diagnosed with autism. Mm -hmm. How did you approach getting them assessed compared to Kane? Well, when my second child was... Um, I suspected autism really early, mm -hmm. but I didn't say anything to anybody just because I wanted to observe it and see what happened. Um, but by 18 months, I knew for sure. I didn't tell my husband. I didn't want to panic him. And I also didn't want to be responsible for a genetic situation that... Um, could have possibly been my fault so I just kept it quiet and when he was diagnosed just before three I was already pregnant with my fourth child so when my third little boy was two I knew and that was very very quick I basically walked into the paediatrician who we were already seeing for my second child and said well, he's, he's got autism, so just quickly sign off <laughs> so, we can get, so we can get started with uh, our early intervention um, and let's just get on with it and not waste any time. And it didn't exactly work that way. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. he did have to go through, the, through the, the process. And with my fourth child, he was very different to the rest. He was verbal early. He um, was social had three other brothers, copied a lot of things. Mm. Um, I, I knew he was autistic. So armed with that anecdotal evidence, were you actively seeking an autism diagnosis? Yes. When I, when I came to the uh, realisation that that's what it was, and by the fourth child, I felt that I was a professional at it. <laughs> Why was it so important to you? Um, totally funding related. Um, we wanted to access services mm. specifically for early intervention um, and not just speech therapy and occupational therapy but family support. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was all really just for to be able to access um, services and uh, help. Mm -hmm. That was it. Uh, it didn't mean anything to me otherwise. Talk me through an average day in your household. Um, well, people sometimes say to me, oh my gosh, you're amazing. You know, you're a single mum with four autistic children. You're incredible. And I always say, no, <laughs> there's an <laughs> army of people that make this happen. Mm -hmm. My mum quit her job to become a full-time carer um, a couple of years ago. Uh, we have help. Uh, we have um, a lady that comes... Uh, every day to help feeding, toileting, bathing, mm. bedtime, you name it. It's everything is uh, a production. If I didn't have that support and help, it would actually be impossible to do. Mm -hmm. Impossible. Would not be possible. Josephine, what was it like for you and your family? How did your husband react to the diagnosis? Um... It was very emotional for him. Um, I guess he didn't want to believe it. And I think it had to do with as well, he comes from a Turkish background. And I do think for both of us, there is some sort of 
I don't want to say shame, but there is that stigma. Don't want to talk about it all. Would that make life easier for you, being able to tell people about your son's condition? Um, I'm not sure it would. Mm -hmm. But the reason I'm here is to sort of get that out and, you know, come forward with it a bit more. What about your family, Josephine, aside from your husband, your own family? I don't talk to my dad much about it. Um, I think it's he's, that he just has so much love for all his grandchildren and to think that something might impair his life, his future, it's hard for him. So I try to avoid that. My mum, it sort of became the same thing. Was it something they just weren't familiar with? Yeah, obviously even for my husband's parents to try and explain in Turkish to his dad what it was and because my parents in their late 60s, 70s, so back then it would have been all oh, the kids naughty or mm. not disciplined and yeah. Why do you think your parents associate the condition with a stigma? I think it's just culture really, it is. Um, they grew up in South America and yeah I think it's something might be wrong and nothing is wrong with him. It's hard to find the fine line in that. And we, we know that support is pivotal in, in families with these, where children have these conditions. Um, Lara, were you able to get funding for your kids once they were diagnosed? My son got the full funding package. Um, my daughter, we had to put in a bid because she was out of time. So we had to put in a special request for her and she got about half and we had about four months in which to use it so that was pretty complex. I might just <laughs> ask you what, what does it mean when you say she's out of time? So they have to be diagnosed by the age of six for the early intervention funding mm -hmm. and she wasn't okay. because it took about 18 months to get her through. Gretchen did you get funding for Kane? No I didn't get any funding for Kane. there was no such thing um, when he was diagnosed <laughs> or even services, uh, there was nothing. What about for your other sons? Did that change? Uh, yeah, well, it did, and that was my, you know, the reason why I pushed for the di did, I wouldn't say I pushed for it. Um, they were going to be diagnosed mm. regardless, but I was anxious to get the diagnosis as soon as possible. I. Uh, have accessed every conceivable service for them and for myself. Let's have a look at how funding works now. Getting a diagnosis means access to funding. This can be spent on government approved services and treatments like psychology and speech pathology. The Helping Children with Autism package was introduced in 2006. Kids with a formal diagnosis can access $12,000 of funding up until their seventh birthday. That package is now being replaced by the NDIS, which will provide lifelong support individualised to a person's needs. The NDIS is rolling out across the country and should cover everyone by 2019. Currently, 28% of all NDIS participants have autism, making it the second largest disability group in the scheme. Michael, what do you think about the current funding model? Um, we've already heard conversation that it biases diagnostic judgment in situations mm -hmm. of uncertainty. So, you know, we just try and help kids the best we can under the current funding model. I also have the problem of seeing kids who don't meet criteria for autism, who have really high level special needs that don't get help. Mm -hmm. And in my heart, I just think it's an unfair system. Do you see parents who are actively seeking a diagnosis to try and alleviate the pressure on them? Oh, absolutely. And as I said before, parents just want to help their kids mm -hmm. and you know, it's a slightly questionable diagnosis. I don't think they mind too much because they just want to help their kids. Peter, tell us about the problems your daughter had and when she was going through school. Um, when my daughter was born, she had a lot of health issues to start off with. So she was born with a congenital heart disease. Uh, she had an airways disease. She was tube fed from an early age. Um, now she's also diagnosed epileptic, central sleep apnea, a few other things. She's still tube fed. So right from day one, pretty much. I was aware of the fact that they thought that there was something going on genetically. Mm -hmm. But as she was entering school, they still hadn't worked out uh, the genetic overall picture. So basically, I, obviously we were seeing the paediatrician quite regularly and we went in one day and I said, look, she's going into school. 
what can we do to help her? And he said, she does fit within the category of autism. That's what we're going to do, and there's your verification for school. Mm -hmm. So what did, the, what did the school tell you to do? Um, I do recall that her ECDP teacher at the time said, no, she's not autistic. We don't think that she is. Mm -hmm. Um, but we did go through with the speech pathology, mm -hmm. the occupational therapist, child psychologist and the paediatrician and they all signed off to say, yep, she fits within that category. Mm -hmm. Even though we know something else is going on that mm -hmm. could also answer this, she fits autism, so let's do that. So were you encouraged to seek that diagnosis even though yes. you knew it was something else? Yes. It was a way forward for her to get support at school. What was she eventually diagnosed with? Uh, February last year, she was actually diagnosed with coffin serous syndrome, uh, which is a, it is a genetic disorder, a very rare, approximately 150 people worldwide. Mm -hmm. But uh, since I've joined a Facebook page for coffin serous syndrome families, we understand now that every person diagnosed with coffin serous syndrome has autistic tendencies. Mm -hmm. So you kept the autism yes. diagnosis then? Yes, because it is, it is a true representation of her. It's mm -hmm. just not all of what's going on with her. So the, the symptoms she has are quite similar to autism, but without that diagnosis, you weren't able to receive Correct. the support Correct, because coffin serous syndrome isn't known. There is no funding whatsoever in Australia or anywhere that I know of uh, that covers kids with coffin serous syndrome. So... She wouldn't have been verified at school um, and the school wouldn't have subsequently got funding for her, which depending on you know, what school she's in would mean that she wouldn't get the support or just that the school didn't have as much financial um, ability to give as much support. So what did the diagnosis mean for you? Uh, the autism diagnosis? Yep. It was just a ticket for us. I mean... We'd already been through five years of keeping this child alive. A piece of paper that was going to help her at school was pretty much all it was. Mm. What do you think about that, Michael? Um, it, it's a story that highlights the problem with the word diagnosis. Mm. So it comes from a medical space and it has an implication that we have a clear and categorical understanding of mm. the problem. Now, I've never heard of coffin serous syndrome, even though I'm a paediatrician. I have not either. <laughs> okay, so... Andrew, have you ever been tempted to diagnose a child with autism when that's not necessarily the case? I think everyone has, and I think clinicians that uh, say otherwise are probably uh, not being too straight with you. Michael, with that, I guess, underlying desire to try and help parents, have you ever been tempted to diagnose autism unnecessarily? No, never unnecessarily. It's always for a purpose about helping kids. There have been situations where my level of discomfort has been at higher levels than other. Again, it sounds like at a point in time you can make a decision with a level of certainty. So do you think it's about labelling a child? Um, I hate labelling, to be honest. I'd rather every child just be a unique individual who's uniquely understood in terms of what they find hard. But labelling's just a necessity in our, in our culture. I, I think rather than being against it, we should just keep striving to do it well. The problem is that you can't get help until they're labelled. And it'd be great to have a system where a struggling kid could just get help. So is it possible then that children are just being misdiagnosed? Um, I think people are doing the best they can with the information that's available to them. So mm. I don't call that a misdiagnosis, but you know, every kid's different. Could doctors miss other problems? I think the, the lure of the funding possibly prevents actually looking at the whole picture with a, an open mind, yes. Have you been able to um, access funding for your children? No, no. Um, my daughter, I took her to a few places. And so they said, no, look, the problem's with you. Insight returns in a moment, but first, British Prime Minister Theresa May says police believe they know the identity of the Manchester attacker. Peace talks. President Trump has met Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas in Bethlehem tonight. And actor Rebel Wilson describes herself to a Melbourne court as a cashed-up bogan as she fights a defamation case. Further updates at 10.30. Dateline. 
a divided Britain. You walk into the supermarket, there's not one English accent. And one man's Brexit fix it. Straight to the point. I want to live in a better town. Dateline, next on SBS. Days of onshore excursions and nights at exclusive private concerts. Treasured memories that last a lifetime. Enjoy an all-inclusive 10-night France River Cruise from only 6645, including return flights. Call 138128 today. Regardless of how urgent or important a job may be, nothing's worth risking your safety. Renee, stop! Step away! Because no matter what you do, safety starts with you. We've taken it to new places. Where will you take it? Now the SatNav is standard. The reinvented I-30. I love the sound of rain on the roof, but I never thought they'd hear it like this. You can give hope where it's needed most. Please donate to the Red Shield Appeal at salvos.org.au. At Kmart Tire and Auto Service, our experts make it easy when you're looking for new tyres. That's why we sell leading brands at low prices every day. And we'll beat competitors' prices on tyres we stock. We deliver genuine value. Every day. Call and book today. Over 4 million Australians communicate in a language other than English. Can your business afford not to connect with this valuable market? In over 70 different languages, SBS in language offers translation, typesetting, subtitling, voiceover and video production. Speak to people in their language. Contact SBS today. I'm Anne Mitchell, youth worker and HESTRA award winner. I run a program that supports young people who are homeless. I find them a safe place to live and make sure if they want help that I'm there for them. We don't want to be rescuers in our young people's lives. We want to be someone who will walk alongside them. She's like the, the brightness to my darkness. The HESTRA award prize money will help me get more young people off the street. That was nice, you nearly made me cry. I have hope for them until they can have hope for themselves. As our Australian star heads to Eurovision, SBS and Holden are offering you the chance to win your own star vehicle, the new Holden Astra. Go to sbs.com.au slash Eurovision to enter and share your Eurovision journey. As a species, we evolved eating meat, but how much is too much? Michael Mosley looks at the cost of our carnivorous obsession. Mosley on meat. Thursday, 8.30 on SBS and On Demand. We're on a mission from God. Car chases, music legends, and fried chicken. Bring me four fried chickens and a Coke. This might just be the greatest movie of all time. The Blues Brothers, Friday, 8.35 on SBS. Miranda, you have um, two children aged 8 and 11. What's their behaviour like at home? Um, well... My daughter is actually at home harder than what my son is, and my son is diagnosed not with autism, um, diagnosed with um, DAMP, deficits in attention, motor skills and perception, ADHD, ODD, dyspraxia and low muscle tone. Um, but my daughter, when she gets home, that's her there, she just, she just melts and there's just fights and she just yells and you'll say it's a nice blue sky and she goes, no, it's green or teal and aqua dots. Mm. like. And my son, when he was two, I put him into childcare and they had no idea what to do with him. Mm. He was like, I think of it now as being like an uncontrolled Labrador. You get this puppy and he just jumps on everything and wrecks everything and, and does all these things. And, and he would hurt people, but he'd never be angry. Mm -hmm. He'd have this big smile on his face and he'd just start whacking into kids. And, and everyone would complain to me. I couldn't take him anywhere. I couldn't do anything. I tried to get my daughter diagnosed and nobody would even look at her. She mimics everything. Mm. She, her favourite day of the school year is NAPLAN test day. Um, so she's not hard for the school. She likes her structure and her routine, but by the time she gets home, she, she's a mess. Um, and so we have an absolute nightmare with her yelling and screaming. So at, at the home, it, it's, it's a bit of a bomb site and everything's crazy and... 
and we get no sort of funding of any description because the diagnosis isn't the right diagnosis to have. You took your kids out of school. You went to Spain yep. for six weeks. Tell us yep. why. Um, it, it got really hard. I, I did homeschool for six months, but found I couldn't juggle that with trying to work and being a single mum. So I listened to what everyone said about structure and you need to do the same things all the time. And I've been to the parenting courses and I'm like, what can I do that strips away all the crap and then just allows you to, to have the basics of life? So I thought, well, why don't we just walk? And I'm, I'm not a walker myself. We had no practice. Um, I was, it was after a really bad day and I called my father and asked him to, to give us a hand to get tickets to go to Spain. Um, we went to Spain and we walked for 500 kilometres. And how did that go? It, it, we had good and bad days. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first two weeks, um, we actually pulled Kirian off medication. So it was, it was very, very, very volatile. There was stone throwing and he fell to the ground a lot and screamed and cried and complained and hit people. And, and we just kept walking. He had no choice but to get up mm -hmm. and keep going. Um, but after the first two weeks, it, it got better. And when you look at some of those photos from your trip, there's one in particular. What's happening in this photograph? <laughs> it was late night flight coming back and he, he'd just had enough and he'd thrown a massive tantrum. In the afternoons, he's always lying somewhere after having a massive meltdown and he's on the floor. Mm -hmm. Have you been able to um, access funding for your children? No, no. Um, my daughter, I took her to a few places when she was younger. I went to psychologists and through other They'd look at her for 10 minutes and she'd talk to them and she'd do everything that needed to be done. And so they said, no, look, the problem's with you. And so I would then attend the counselling sessions and do parenting courses. And they gave me some tips, they really did. Mm -hmm. But they don't fix the issues that are at hand. They don't fix what's going on. Do you think it's autism? Autism is a really broad spectrum. And I would say that, yes, definitely for my daughter. Um, she, she's just so detached. So yes, I would say with her, it definitely is with my son. I don't know the autism spectrum stuff. It looks right, but when I was explained damp, whether I was explained correctly or not, I don't know. And it says it's more about motor neuron connections and after a long period of time, it can start to get better. I'm, I'm not a doctor. I, I don't know what the real difference is, but when I read through all the autism stuff and I'm looking at it going, oh my God, that's, that's what we deal with, except my son will look you in the face and he will talk to you till his ears fall off. Andrew, do you think the current system is fair? I think it could be fairer. I think is probably the, um, the words that, I, that I'd choose. I mean, I think this is a classic example of um, a, a child who needed um, assistance mm -hmm. uh, early on in life um, and to get the resources and assistance that that child needed, there, mm -hmm. there would have had to be a, a diagnosis uh, given. Whether that diagnosis was appropriate is, is clearly very arguable. Mm -hmm. And so why are we looking at their diagnostic criteria rather than actually looking at the child in front of us? So you're working to create national guidelines for autism diagnosis. What are you hoping for? Um, I, we're hoping for uniformity. Um, so what we're doing at the moment is we're uh, developing with the National Disability Insurance Agency, we're developing national guidelines for how we diagnose autism. Mm -hmm. What we're looking to do is come up with a standardised way to appraise those behaviours. Mm -hmm. And the, the end goal um, is to create equity. What we need is equity. At the moment we have a system where uh, uh, the, the likelihood of a diagnosis does change based on the postcode in which you live. Mm -hmm. It does change based upon um, how cluey your uh, family is in understanding how the system works. Mm -hmm. That's not good for anyone. Michael, do you think national guidelines will help? I do think they'll help. I wouldn't use the word equity. I think that's wrong. I think it'll create more consistency, which is a good mm -hmm. thing. But equity implies that each child in the society gets an equal opportunity for help. Mm. And if we've got this one thing for autism, but not, you know, for every child with autism, there's probably another mm. five to ten kids with equally valid special needs mm -hmm. that aren't autistic. Mm. And so I can't call that equity. Mm. Peter, you're an advisor on the National Disability Insurance Agency who's rolling out the NDIS. Um, what's the current funding system design like? 
Look, the, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, um, the act that, that gives life to it, it's very clear about, about um, who's eligible for reasonable and necessary supports. It's about the functional impact. It doesn't seek to name or, or, or diagnose as a starting point. Mm -hmm. So what the scheme seeks to do through early intervention is, is make that access easier mm -hmm. for families that have a child that has something going on for them. Now that doesn't automatically trigger entry to the scheme, but what it does is it starts to trigger the right conversations. Michael, when we're talking about autism funding, are there stakeholders profiting from the way it's currently set out? I don't think the issue is the financial mm -hmm. incentives. The issue is the accountability for what you get for your money. Mm -hmm. So the current system, I think its biggest flaw is that it's con conceptualised as activity. You go and you get X number of services or you have a number of services until you've spent a certain amount of money, but there's very little accountability for what you get. And in a consumer society, if you're building a house, you don't say to a tradesman, I've got $16,000 to spend on the house, just come and do stuff. Mm. You actually have a clear sense of purpose of what you want for your money. And to me, the important thing is the accountability of how we spend the money. Mm -hmm. mm. Finally, what do you hope for the future, Kane? Um, I hope for a job to be able to give that support to not just my brothers but my whole family. But I want to be a productive part of society, but it feels like society isn't giving me the chance to do it. Mm. Mm. That will really happen when um, autism still... I, I, I can't believe I even need to say this, but autism still has the stigma attached to it that it does. Yeah. When, you, when people usually hear the word autistic, they think different in a very bad way. They think sick. They think damaged. They think weak. We are not weak. We are not damaged. We are not sick. We don't need to be cured. We don't need to be fixed. It's the rest of the world that needs to catch up with us because... <laughs> Does your diagnosis change how you see yourself? Um, it, only in the sense that it allowed me to like, get a proper idea on why I'm different. Mm -hmm. I, I, at, at the moment, I'm doing a childcare course at TAFE because while I definitely understand autism, or at least through living it, mm -hmm. I don't understand kids because, like I said, I didn't socialise a lot in school, so I wanted to catch. I want to catch up on on that problem time, and if they ever come across the problems that I did, my brothers, b b because all the time at home, like um, mom and Fafa and the um, the nanny keep commenting on how much they're turning up like me. Mm -hmm. They're looking like me, they're talking like me, they're doing all the same activities that I was obsessed with at their age and in certain cases still obsessed with. So if it does get to a point where the darker aspects of my own psychological makeup, if that's true for them as well, I want to be able to give them, like I said, I want to be able to give them the support I didn't have because the world needs different. Thank you very much, Kane. Thank you all for your honesty. That's all we have time for here, but let's keep talking on Twitter and Facebook. I always told my daughter that I wanted lots of grandchildren, but I never ever thought for a moment that I was going to be bringing them up. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for parenting, and they, were, they weren't prepared for grandparenting. My mum loved it, and it kept her young, and I think that's what it does to me. Most of our salary used to go in just paying childcare. We just thought we... We well, might ask them. If you we... might ask them yeah. mm. <laughs> to come from India to Australia. We'll be back next week. Stay tuned now for Dateline. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate that. Thank you.